What is the John shot? I mean, John. John. John, we got to here at the beginning. He came here in 1980 in the School of Photographic uh, Science and Instrumentation uh, in the College of Imaging Arts and Science. He came here in 1980. And then in, and, and then in 1985, he wanted to form the center, he wanted to do research. And some of the faculty in the center said he was too applied. Some of the faculty outside of the center said he was too theoretical. And some of the people that were in neither of those categories said he relies too much on outside funding, especially from the government. And uh, did John cry? I mean, he might have, but I don't know. He, he hung in there, he persevered, and he overcame that resistance. Uh, he's become a leader. Uh, he, he's, published, he's published hundreds of articles, reports, uh, books, uh, conference proceedings. He, he's got over a hundred, uh, he's advised over a hundred masters and PhD students. Uh, he's, he's an innovator. He, he's, he's just been uh, terrific. He's been a giant for CIS. And we ought to hear it for John Shaw. I really think so. John. While you all are enjoying your dessert and coffee, um, John Schott, as uh, most of you know, recently published a book through RIT Press on the history of the Center for Imaging Science. So John has graciously agreed to give uh, a brief presentation about the history of the Center. Um, and then I'm going to follow up with just a couple of charts on sort of where we're at right now. So most of you, many of you probably know this, but John joined RIT in 1980. And he was one of the instrumental faculty in establishing the center and the imaging science degree program and the growth of research at RIT in general. John is an internationally recognized expert in the area of remote sensing systems. And he retired from RIT in 2017, although bizarrely, I still have to give him an office. <laughs> and he does occasionally come in and, and cause trouble. So anyway. Um, like I said, John has recently published a book on the history of the Center for Imaging Science, and he's graciously agreed to tell us that story tonight. So, John, please come up. Thank you, David. I have to begin by making a uh, pretty important correction to some of the advertising literature that came out for this uh, meeting. My students have called me many things. <laughs> my, my colleagues have called me many more, and typically not as nice. But beloved was, was never amongst them. I asked about that, and they said, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Every year when our first uh, entering class comes in, we sit them down, and sort of a life breaker, and, and also because we want to see if there's a thread, we ask the students, how did you find photographic science? How did you find imaging science? And I'm going to use that approach to, uh, to start the story tonight and uh, take you back to the very early days of photographic science and tell you a little bit about how I found the program because it introduces some of the characters and some of the uh, nature of the program at the time. I finished my baccalaureate degree and uh, started at a research center in Buffalo. And uh, that funny guy with the long hairs, uh, me before the Fu Manchu I did. So we, working there at uh, CalSpan with my baccalaureate degree, I got a little bit of visibility, and I convinced them to send me off to graduate school at uh, Syracuse. So I go to Syracuse, and I'm sitting up in the uh, attic of Bray Hall, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday nights. I was only in Syracuse a couple days, the rest of the time I was still working in Buffalo. And nobody, everybody's gone, it's 11 o'clock at night, and I hear this funny music coming down the hallway. So I 
walk down the very dim, dingy hallways in the attic, and then the next bay down, there's one guy studying. Well, he wasn't studying. He was sitting there playing his banjo. So I go up to meet him, and it turns out it's uh, this fellow, John Roberts. <laughs> was like me. He was just a couple years older than the other students. He was working at Romer Development Center. And it turns out John and I knew each other. We'd never met, but his group at uh, Rome sponsored the work that I was doing at uh, Kelsman Corporation. So I heard of him, he heard of me, and we hit it off. We would periodically late at night uh, kick ideas around. And we quickly came to realize that the two of us do a lot about using cameras as scientific instruments. And they weren't teaching us that at Syracuse. And so we got talking about how do you know this stuff, how do you know that stuff. And I learned it all at what was reputed to be one of the finest research centers in the country, having worked there for a few years. And he learned it as an undergraduate in the photographic science department at RIT. So this was my first introduction to photographic science at RIT. I was living in Buffalo, RIT's 60 miles down the road. I knew RIT existed, but I had never heard of photographic science. So I'm commuting back and forth from Syracuse to Buffalo, and I uh, stopped one night to visit my youngest sister, who's a nurse at Strong. And she says, well, let's go to a party. And I said, sure. Well, single guy, happy to go to a party with a bunch of nurses. <laughs> It turns out, uh, Susie takes me to a party with a whole bunch of photo science people. She's dating a photo science guy. And I'm sitting at the party and end up sitting next to this scruffy old guy who uh, turns out to be Ron Francis, the chairman of the department. And, and, and Ron and I start talking, and he finds out that I'm a remote sensor, that I'm studying for my PhD at, at uh, Syracuse. And he says, well, you know, our sponsors are really interested in having us do more remote sensing work, and uh, when you finish your degree, we'd really like to talk to you. Well, college party, few beers, I completely forgot this conversation. <laughs> oh, a few more years go by. <laughs> yeah, a few more years go by, and uh, I uh, get a call from Ron. He has run into my now brother-in-law at a, uh, a kid together, and uh, Bob tells him, John's finished his degree, he's still hanging out at Calspan, and I get a call from Ron saying, we'd like you to come. But I won't go through all the many iterations, mm -hmm. but I eventually talk to Dr. Francis, and he tells me about this program, they want to grow it, they'd like to put together a PhD in imaging science, photographic science. And I talked to Russ Krauss, who was the head of the photographic school at the time. He says, we really wanted to do research. We'd like, like you to come in and, and start building research. Long story short, I uh, say, okay. And my <laughs> colleagues at uh, Cornell Aeronautical Labs, later Kelspan, throw a big party. I won't go into why they threw a big party. It had very little to do with me. But I happened to be uh, one of the few people who, in the eight years I was there, left to my own volition. Galspan shrank from 1,600 people to 800 people in those eight years post-Vietnam. Things were kind of tough. The important part of this is they were really happy to see me go, and they let me take much of my laboratory with me. And that's going to play a role. So I get to college, and I, I have to say, this, this gentleman, when you use that word, beloved, it, it, did, it did apply to him. He was the student's champion. He was very well loved by the students. This, this is a picture of mine. This, this is Ron mugging for the mug shots we used to have on the wall in the sensitometry complex. Each student, it's check in and check out, you had to check in through your, your photo and you had to get a mug shot to get your photo. And this is Ron clowning for the mug shots he wanted everybody to, uh, to get. Well, I show up and 
I don't know what I've gotten myself into. <laughs> the department didn't do PhD work. They didn't have a PhD. They brought me in to help do that. Okay, so that's okay. Then I found out the whole institute didn't have a PhD program. I was a 28-year-old kid at the time, pretty naive. I hadn't checked that into that. <laughs> and then I found out not only did we not offer PhD degrees, we didn't have a charter from the state to offer PhD degrees. Well, I'm going to step me back a little bit. Then I found out, well, not only does the photoscience department not do much research, the institute doesn't do much research. They just started the research corporation. They were doing a little bit of contract research, uh, mostly off campus. So I'm sitting there, well, what am I doing here? And then, as you can see from this picture, everybody left. And it might have had something to do with me. Uh, but a bunch of these guys have been around for a long time. John Carson, who I was desperate to come and learn some optics from and do some optics, leaves. And so it's sort of Ron and I, uh, after a year, well, Ron starts trying to hire some new faculty, and I started doing some research. And we got really lucky, and within uh, that first year, we won a big grant from NASA and a bunch of smaller grants, and we start doing some research. And as you can see here in the red, that encouraged the dean to say, well, let's, we got this research going. It's one of the key components of doctoral studies. Let's put together a, a team to look into a doctoral program in then photographic science. This next step was going to plague us for a while. He says, well, let's get the whole college in on this and form a committee to form a, figure out how we're going to do a, a degree. And we'll let the printers help and we'll let the photo, uh, our fine arts photo people and the graphic arts photo people help try to find this program. So we started that, I guess. Uh, at the same time that we're trying to hire these faculty, we got involved with the microelectronics activities. Electrical engineering had been seeing tons and tons of kids, photoscience kids, getting hired to support the microelectronics industry because they knew how to put printed circuits down onto photoresistance, a photo imaging photo photochemical process. So they said, well, we're going to take advantage of this. We've got a big electrical engineering undergraduate program. We've got these photoscientists. Let's build a program in microelectronics engineering, which got kicked off in 1983, which committed us to teaching half the courses in the microelectronics program. Lynn Fuller headed that, did a fine job. Uh, but we're now teaching and trying to staff up not only our own courses, but all the courses to teach all these swarms of microelectronics students. And like we also kicks off a building in 1985. Well, RIT is a small place, and word of this possible PhD program in imaging science starts to spread around campus. And the Dean of Graduate Studies starts a committee to say, should we be doing doctoral level work? An important part of that committee is nobody from photoscience is on the committee. <laughs> Gosh, you know, we should have known something was going on. And uh, the committee reports out, and they say, no way. We've got to have every master's program in the sciences at top tier before we consider a, a PhD. Uh, it's going to form a two-tiered faculty. We're going to have to publish a parish all over campus. Goes on and on, a whole bunch of made-up reasons why we shouldn't have a, uh, a PhD anywhere on campus. Well, this committee that had been chewing around for two years at this point quickly pops out their half-baked PhD proposal. The only part of it that's important is they have a point-by-point -point, uh, rebuttal of the issues that the, the Madhu report, the report of the uh, graduate policy uh, comes out with. Well, neither of these things are important except that they got the senior administration's attention, and the senior administration, the provost, forms a committee to say, should we do research, one committee, should we move to the PhD, second committee? These are campus-wide committees with the authority of the provost. They're going to have some impact. Well, a few years have gone by. There's a whole new faculty. Here are some of the 
players listed, but I want to call your attention to the character in the top right. Bill Brower came to us in 1983-84. Uh, he came to us having started at the uh, Physical Science Research Center at Boston University, which became iTech Corporation. He then formed his own company called The Fraction Limited. In all of these roles, he was designing and then building large optical systems that went on the U-2 aircraft and then the early space reconnaissance aircraft. Very, very impressive gentleman. So he had sort of retired, was doing some consulting, came to us, and he started getting very intrigued with what was going on in imaging science. He was teaching optics for us, commuting back to Boston, where he lived most of his life. And he started saying, you know, we could really do something here. We could form a national center. We could integrate not only photographic science, but the evolving field of electronic imaging, digital imaging, and computer vision. He comes back the next fall, after going home for the summer, 1984-85, and we convince him to be the chairman of the department, photographic science. Photographic science and imaging, then we changed the name. Uh, and Villem continues to push this idea along with Russ Krauss. Russ Krauss is the head of the School of Photography that, that the uh, department was in at the time and had insights into the senior administration and what might work and what might not. Because we were pretty juvenile, right? This whole brand new faculty. The director's only been there two years, the chairman's only been there two years. Luckily, at about the same time, this character named Kohler, who was head of the Office of Development and Engineering at the Central Intelligence Agency, also a photo science graduate, as you heard, knows Kohler, or knows uh, Brower from his time at ITEC and knew his work, starts saying, you know, we'd like to do more work with RIT. We, the CIA, would like to do more work with RIT, particularly in the area of imaging and remote sensing. And Brower, speaking from inside the program, and Kohler, speaking from outside, start to get the Institute's senior management interested in growing this relationship. And they start talking about what uh, was documented in a memorandum of agreement uh, between CIA and RIT about how we should do business in the future. Well, all of this sorts of come to head in calendar year 1985. Very important year for the center and I think for the Institute. In uh, March of 85, the Nystrom Committee reports out that the committee that proposed to charge on graduate education saying, should we be doing graduate education? Really, should we do a PhD programs? And they come out diametrically opposed to the Medu report. Graduate education is good, we should have a PhD, we should get the charter changed. Everybody knew that about <coughs> imaging science because imaging science was going to be the first PhD. And grad graduate education is good for undergraduates as well, which is one of the big charges. Somehow we're going to destroy undergraduate education by having one PhD with about 10 students in it. April of that year, the Johnston Committee on Encouraging Research comes out. Same finding. Research is not only okay, it's good. It will be very good for the Institute. It's kind of hard to date. Imagine that these two flavors of things are happening at the same time, one saying absolutely no, one saying absolutely yes, but it reflects the dichotomy that existed at the Institute in the, uh, the mid-80s. People were uncomfortable taking that next step. 1985, in uh, May, Brower finally convinces, after a few tries, the Institute that we should form this Center for Imaging Science, should be a national center, should focus on research and education, it would be the first center of combined research and education in the Institute. A month later, Brower resigns. He was a kind of cranky coot, one of my favorite people on earth, but could be a little cantankerous. And one of the versions of this memorandum of agreement between the CIA and RIT had the director of the center reporting through a cabal of deans 
to try and get anything done, and Bill didn't like that. Never happened, by the way, but it was enough to tick Bill off. They asked me to be the director. I, I bowed on, this is the first time I bowed of many to being the director of the center, uh, and said, you know, you gotta do something serious here. I'm, I'm a 29 year old kid, 30, 32 year old kid, I guess at this point. We need somebody serious, somebody senior, who's gonna make this run and somebody who you're gonna respect. Well, luckily for the center, uh, there's this fellow, Bob Desmond, who had been uh, the head of the research corporation, president of the research corporation. I had worked with him uh, for many years uh, in his role as president of the research corporation. We felt some respect, the provost, and he got along really well. And they convinced him to take the job for a year, mainly to uh, nurse the center through a year while we found a permanent director. Bob would go on to be uh, dean of the college that we were in and very helpful, and helpful in many ways I'll, I'll get to in a minute. The provost also kicks out an institute-wide study group to form a proposal for a PhD in imaging science. Uh, I won't go into this very much, but again, it's a, an institute-wide study group. That means every college in the institute is represented trying to put together a PhD in imaging science. Along the way, Debbie had helped us work with uh, Alphonse D'Amato, our senator at the time, to get a proposal and to get some money to finish building the microelectronics building and to help start a building for a physical center for imaging science. So now we're talking, we've just formed a, a, a conceptual center with a few faculty and we're now talking about a building as well. Well, a few years go by and everybody's gone again. Now, luckily, some of these folks could go back. The color program here, Frank Crow and Roy Burns, simply didn't join the center when we formed the center, but they would be talked into joining us again a couple years later. Uh, Bobby Kohler comes into play here again because he left the government, went to work for industry, joined the Board of Trustees in 1988, and he, along with Rich Rose, would start a campaign with the Board of Trustees to move this potential PhD in imaging science forward. It was a big problem at the time because much of the board thought about RIT the way it was in the 60s. It was a program to train the technicians and the employees they needed to run their factories. And here we are talking about a, a PhD, and that was kind of an F at the time. Uh, Bob Desmond comes in and he says, okay, I'm, I'll be the director for the year. I don't want any imaging science, so I don't challenge any of the imaging science faculty. But he knew the institute well. He started smoothing the way for this potential PhD to move through the RIT system. And because he knew the, the program, institute-wide program, very helpful with that, he also chaired this institute-wide committee that was supposed to put the proposal together. He would become the dean the next year. He was sort of a troubleshooter for the provost of this. First year troubleshooter, he was imaging science, and he troubleshooter would be the dean of there college, and then Bob would leave for a couple of years and come back as the associate provost or junior provost, as I called him at the time. <laughs> Through all of this, he would help us fight the battles to raise the money, particularly in his role as the dean, and then as the provost, to fill the faculty. So here we are, this little program, we got no people again here. How are we going to fill a faculty big enough to run all the programs we're already committed to, and the PhD program. So over the next few years, Bob helped us add 13 faculty to the program, some of them transferring in, uh, many of them new, to eventually teach this PhD program. Well, along the way, this building that we're talking about runs into some issues. Uh, the, the earmark from El Amado raises five and a half million dollars for us, but the building's gonna cost eight or nine million dollars, and we need to raise some money. Well, the Institute decides to throw a little monkey wrench at us and say, we're not even gonna break ground till every penny is in the bank. I don't think we've done this for any other building, but imaging science is now very highly visible. We're gonna be the first PhD. They can't take many, any money out of the general revenues to help with that because they've told the Institute, it's not gonna cost that much. All, all the other people are here, it's not gonna cost that much. 
So we go out to try and raise another three and a half million dollars, that's eight million dollars in today's dollars. There's no faculty. How are we going to do this? I won't go into all the details of that, but we go out and we start the process of raising money. There are a whole bunch of other issues that come up with this building. Uh, Jeff Pelz will tell you great stories about <laughs> negotiating with the beautification committee to build a building that's not 100% brick. Uh, brick City Weekend, you can appreciate that. And, and then we had to redesign as all of these new faculties, 13 new faculty. Everyone comes in, wants their own lab, wants it to look like this. And it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Jeff, Jeff knows these stories better than I do. Well, we succeed. I guess we're half a million dollars shy when we broke ground, but we had money. the money promised, so they let us break ground in 87. We throw a big party. Rodney Shaw has been drafted as the director by this time. That was one of Bob Desmond's big jobs, was to find us a longer-term director. Rodney would be with us for five years, and he loved parties. So we threw a big party at the dedication of the building. His characters from left to right are uh, David Kearns, head of Xerox at the time, Doris Carson, the wife of Chester, the building is named after, the developer of geography. Way on the right is Thomas Plow, who's the provost. And people my age recognize that guy, Walter Cronkite, right? So, an, an impressive crew there at the dedication. Meanwhile, a PhD program, proposal is moving forward. This was an unbelievable nightmare. We've got a committee made up of faculty from all across the institute, some of whom knew a little bit about imaging, some of whom knew nothing, uh, some of whom had been to a research program, some of them not, trying to put together this proposal for us, a PhD in imaging. We've got a faculty who think they know how to teach imaging because that's what they do for a living, and they're not on the committee. The committee had, I think, two people from imaging on it. So we went through a lot of back and forth for three years trying to design and build a proposal to, to offer a PhD in imaging science. And we went through every step of scrutiny you can imagine because it's the first one in the institute and there's a whole bunch of people who don't want this to happen. So each step we would get all sorts of criticism, we rewrite the proposal, we take the next step. We write all sorts of criticism, write it again. So this went on for three years to write this proposal. Finally, in the fall of 1989, 30 years ago. October, we opened the building. You couldn't find a scrap of paper on the floor of that building for several years. We were so pleased with that building. Didn't, didn't even hit the ground, somebody would pick it up. Faculty, staff, student. So we opened the building in 1989 in October. Just before Christmas, we hear back from the state. So we sent the proposal in almost a year earlier to the state. It's a long time for the state to sit on a proposal. Do you know there's a little college down the river from RIT? <laughs> they weren't sure they wanted another doctoral program in Rochester. Anyways, a lot of lobbying going on in uh, Albany that year, but finally just before Christmas, Christmas present for those of us who worked on it for so long, the state authorizes RIT to change its charter so they can offer a PhD and simultaneously approves the PhD program for imaging science. So here we are 30 years ago, everything was in shape. Here's some of the players, just the dedication. I want to flag two of them. How did that eight million in today's dollars come about? Rodney Shaw, Dana Marsh, Dana Marsh is one of the unsung heroes. He had lots of connections in Xerox, he worked for many years uh, on the international side of Xerox. He helped travel, Rodney and some of the faculty traveled all over the world, literally all over the world, to raise that money. So these guys, in just a couple of years, raised this three and a half million dollars we needed from corporate sponsors. Bill Castle, bottom left there, and Debbie to the Office of Government Affairs. They, did, they kept telling me that was what they really were, but Government Affairs uh, raised the money from, with the help of Senator El D'Amato to uh, put the five and a half million together. And we've got this building not only moving, but completely paid for, no loans, no debt. Here's another 
bundle of the faculty. I just put these in because between the two of them, you've got most of the faculty and many of the staff who were playing the game in those days. Two people missing from these two somehow. Jeff Kulse snuck by and uh, Zoran Ninkoff managed to not be in these, uh, these two photos. Why are we doing all this? We often forget, I don't think any of the faculty forget, but when we tell these stories, we often forget. It's all about these young people that were trying to get degrees so that they can go out and make a difference in this field that we're trying to define. And so here's just one of a few pictures I've got of the students. This is Jeff Pelz. He figured out that he was going to teach the first class in the new building. And he decides he's going to form the first class club. And so here's he, Jeff. Jeff's the little guy in the middle of that picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, with, the with the vertical striped shirt. He's still the little guy in the middle of the picture. Uh, and, his, and his undergraduate class. 20 years later, here's a crew of high school students, undergraduates, graduates, and staff who'd been out all day taking data and are posed for this picture underneath that very modern aircraft. <laughs> I couldn't give a talk like this without acknowledging a program that's been here at uh, Imaging Science. Sixties, I think 65 is the actual start date. Since the 1960s, photo that imaging science has been educating U.S. Air Force officers in the dark blue and Canadian Air Force officers in the light blue to get their MS and doctoral degrees and then go back to their organizations and do the imaging and photo reconnaissance that they need. And we're not just teaching them, they're going out and making a difference. And this is just a, a crew at a one international uh, scientific meeting where we put out a quick call and said, anybody from Photoscience show up who's given a paper today? So this is current students, former students, any affiliate. So this little tiny program, very tiny program, uh, makes a big difference in the, uh, the scientific community. I'm going to start to wrap things up. Uh, and I need to acknowledge some very critical people. Uh, before I do that, I have to say that I'm stopping now. It's 89, there's many years to come. Some of the center's greatest years and some of the center's most difficult years are still ahead of it. Buy the book and read the story. Uh, <laughs> but I, I gotta acknowledge the people whose vision really made this happen. As I mentioned, as early as 1980, Rob Francis is pitching a PhD to me. He wanted there to be a PhD program. Frankly, I think he just loved the students so much he wanted them to hang around longer. We, we had what we called in those days the five-year program to get a BS and an MS. The students called it the eight-year program. Uh, and there were many of them here for a long time. Ron had the vision he wanted a doctoral program. Russ Krauss, who is not well known in the center, but Russ drafted me to, bring, to do research. He wanted research. He understood if we were going to move to a PhD, we had to do research. He did a lot of work to help me with the senior administration, particularly Bill Dempsey, the VP of Finance, to put in place the tools that we needed in order to do serious research on campus. We would not have a center without Bill O'Brien. Crotchety, cranky, one of my favorite people on earth. It was his vision to have this national center and frankly to use the intelligence community's interest in him and interest in the center to pitch it to the senior administration. He knew that intelligence activities would only ever be a fraction of what we did, but it was the key to get the thing going. I seldom, maybe never, say nice things about administration. <laughs> So I have to be careful here. Uh, Bob Desmond helped us through many critical steps. Again, not well known for the center. He was only there for a year, but in his role as dean and then as uh, associate provost, he was very critical in making the uh, fiscal moves with us that would move the center forward. Debbie, I talked about for the building, but Debbie has been a factor in the center throughout his lifetime, helping us when we needed to interact with the government and bring in 
significant programs to fund our research program. She's also been a good friend for years. Rich Rose made this all happen. He got behind the PhD, took him a little while. When he decided it was gonna happen, he leaned on the deans. The deans were very powerful in his era. He, he inherited a university that was run by deans. They'd been there for 20 years each. He convinced the deans that this PhD was a good idea. To go convince your faculty, this is a good thing. It's gonna work. He helped us raise the money. Very much the man behind uh, on the administration level making this place work. Talked all the trustees into making it work. My story doesn't go this far because I don't have enough time, but El Simone came in when the center was having some of its toughest times. And he could easily have said, we're gonna shut this place down. Matter of fact, he did try to do it a couple of times. Uh, but he decided the place was worth saving, got behind it, and helped us get through the tough times and uh, build the center into what it is today. One of the key people he used to do that was Ed Trusbillowitz. Brought Ed in when we were at, uh, down and nearly out. And Ed, I think, was one of the finest managers I've ever worked with. And he helped us sort out the issues at the center and uh, put it back on its feet. And I think uh, Ed, again, is one of the very well-loved members of our history. I'm gonna wrap up by saying thank you to just a couple of people. Uh, I hope some of you saw this book that's out there, because uh, we're trying to get rid of them. Uh, but uh, three people fronted money so that we could print the, uh, the book. Uh, Dave, Sophia, and Ryan all stepped up. Dave said I had, Dave did the work on this. He said I made one quick phone call, everybody said yes, we're in, so that we could fully print the book and make it available for everybody. Finally, I have to say thank you to somebody, I think has gotten more hugs than me tonight. No. Uh, Pam fed us so many Christmas dinners <laughs> over the years, uh, hundreds at a time. We would have for our Christmas parties, she would prepare it fix the food and make everybody happy. Countless Thanksgiving dinners, countless St. Patty's Day dinners, and Harry Gross is in the back drooling just talking to me talking about it. <laughs> Pam has helped me with so many things I might go into tonight, but I think all of us owe her a big thank you for all that food.